story of Jacob and Esau is perhaps one of the most well-known in the Old Testament, I would say. Perhaps one of the most legendary stories in all of the Bible. And if we could draw back the curtains of the great controversy, we would see the spirits behind this story were the same as behind that of Cain and Abel. You see, God's people have always been at odds and at war in a spiritual sense with Satan's people. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 25, and we'll read a little bit from this story. There's one very specific portion I want to focus on today. And it's found in Genesis 25, starting in verse 24. It says, And when her days, that is Rebecca, to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red, all over like an hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. In fact, that's why he was called Edom. Esau means red. The boys grew. Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Uh, that right there is one of the primary mistakes that Isaac and Rebekah made was choosing favorites. But let's continue reading. Jacob sawed pottage. He was kind of the cook of the family. Esau was a hunter. Jacob was the cook. Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with some of that red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. Now, if you remember earlier in Genesis, what does the name Jacob mean? Deceiver or supplanter. So Jacob was living up to his name. He was. This was a very sneaky, underhanded, kind of dirty move right here. Now, have you ever been working really hard, and by the time lunch comes around, you feel faint from hunger? Maybe you've got low blood sugar. Uh, people with hypoglycemia deal with this all the time, diabetics. Um, Jacob was faint. Not, not Jacob. Esau was so hungry that that's all he could focus on. In fact, it goes on to say, Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what shall this birthright do to me? What good is it? I, I'm going to die from hunger. What good is this? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. You see, Esau's problem here was he was focused on the temporal and the physical. He refused to see beyond that into the spiritual, which was the birthright. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink, and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now these are some very interesting things here. Despised means uh, to disesteem, or to disdain, or think to scorn. Now, when it says that Esau sold his birthright, it means to sell or to surrender, but the most fascinating definition here means to sell self. Esau was willing to sell his soul, essentially, for a temporary pleasure. Now, for everybody in here, uh, everybody in the world, we all have different sins that we struggle with. We all have different uh, idols, perhaps, that, that we still worship. We, st we all are still sinners in need of a Savior. Now, Esau's idol in this story happened to be food. For some people, it could be money, it could be uh, fame, it could be clout, it could be any number of things. Now, some other versions of this text put some very interesting uh, spins on this. The Amplified Classic says that Esau scorned his birthright as beneath his notice. Have you ever seen somebody kind of turn their nose up at you? Kind of this kind of an arrogance thing is what it's talking about here. The NLT says it this way. It says that he showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn. That's what the birthright primarily was, was your rights as the firstborn son. And Esau shrugged it off as if it didn't matter. He didn't care about his birthright as long as his immediate needs were met. He failed to look into the future to see what really mattered. You see, Jesus told us to avoid this kind of mindset in Mark chapter 8, 36. And Jesus says, What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What is it you love the most? 
Now, I know we're Adventists and the good Christian answer would be Jesus, right? But let's think of um, as something of, of other things. Other than Jesus, what do you love the most? And if Jesus would come to you and say, hey, put that aside and follow me, would you be willing to put whatever that is aside to follow Jesus wholeheartedly? What if, like Abraham, God came to you and says, give me your child? Maybe that's what's most important to you. What if, what if, like the rich young ruler, Jesus came to you and says, give me all of your wealth? You know, and for everybody here, it's going to be something slightly different because we're all different people. Esau is basically asking, what good will these eternal realities be to me if I'm going to die from hunger in this moment? He was so concerned with his physical needs that he didn't care about anything else. Now, in terms of a birthright, what is a birthright in the Old Testament? What was a birthright in the Israelite culture and nation and in many of the ancient cultures? Well, the firstborn son uh, in the Hebrew family occupied a prominent place. Um, for anybody who doesn't get the text written down, who likes to take notes, I, I'll be happy to share the PDF file with you later. Um, it, the firstborn son also had a double portion of the inheritance. Uh, so if son number two got $500 of inheritance, son number one would get $1,000. They got a double portion of the wealth. Uh, the firstborn son also took the position as the spiritual leader of the family until Israel was founded as a nation. Uh, and that's really what Jacob wanted. He wanted position as leader of the family, whereas Esau wanted the wealth. The firstborn son also represented the Messiah in a very special way because it, they symbolized and pointed forward to the fulfillment of the Messianic prophecies. The Bible calls Jesus the firstborn over all creation. And so it's also important to note, though, according to 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, that if you were to do something uh, considered particularly heinous or stupid or immoral or what have you, you know, uh, you could lose your rights as the firstborn son. You would lose your birthright. For example, in the story of Reuben. Uh, do you remember what Reuben did? He slept with his father's concubines, right? And, and because of that mistake, Jacob said, you're no longer getting the birthright as the firstborn son. That's falling to somebody else. The tribe of Levite actually got the spiritual leadership of the nation. Now, Esau, remember, he said, behold, I am at the point to die. What profit shall this birthright do to me? Now, we need to apply this to our situation. Perhaps some people will say, uh, I'm a single mother with five kids and I can't afford to pay tithe. What good will this tithe do to me if I can't pay my bills? And thus we will despise our birthright. Some people will say, maybe my job requires me to work weekends, including Saturday. What good will remember the Sabbath do to me? and thus we despise our birthright. Perhaps it's an issue of health for us, and we say, well, I can't afford to uh, buy healthy food products, so I'm just going to buy this cheap ham. What good is the health message going to do to me? You know, and thus we despise our birthright. You know, um, do we see the profit in serving God? Do we see the prophet in serving God as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian? We are a very unique people, as we talked about in Sabbath school. We have a perspective on things that, that nobody else does, and God has called us to that birthright. You know, there are many people that are described uh, in Isaiah chapter 30. And God, speaking through Isaiah, he says this, Now go write it before them in a table, and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits, get out of the way, turn aside out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. You see, there are many people within Christianity, sadly within our own denomination, they want the benefits that God promises without complying with his requirements. 
what do we value more highly? Is what we really have to answer. That's what Isaiah is calling us to answer. What if you're in a situation where you have to choose between uh, working and making a full-time income or keeping the Sabbath? What are you going to choose if you can't do both? What if you're in a situation where that promises financial security on condition of breaking any one of God's commandments? What are you going to choose? Uh, many people we see are in the story of Job. Uh, we have people who are blatantly rejecting God's commandments, and we also have people who are struggling with accepting their birthright as God's children. And we see this described in the way that Job felt in Job chapter 21. Notice Job's struggle during this text. This is Job speaking. It says, Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, and are mighty in power? Their seed is established in, the, in their sight with them and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull gendereth and faileth not, nor their, their cow calveth and casteth not her calf. Remember back in those days, livestock was wealth. They send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance. They take the timbrel and the harp and rejoice at the sound of the organ. They, they spend their days in wealth, and in a moment go down to the grave. Therefore they say unto God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. And notice what Job is struggling with here in this verse 20, uh, 15. He says, What is the Almighty that we should serve him? What profit should we have if we pray unto him? Job's struggle, if you remember reading the book of Job, what happened to him? He lost all of his wealth, which was his livestock. He lost his children, all of his children. He, he, he lost his health. And he very nearly lost his marriage, too, I would say, because you read the book of Job, and what did his wife tell him? Curse God and what? Die. And so Job was in a very difficult situation. And I want to point out, for, for those who feel depressed, like Job did in this text, that's not the problem. That's, that's not a sin, right? Because the Bible says that Job, in all of this, Job sinned not. Because he stayed focused on God as hard as he, as hard as he was having a time of, he stayed focused on God. But in too often is the case in people who feel like this, all it takes is a simple push that, to, to make them leave God and church altogether. And, and, to, and I don't know how Job stayed faithful to God with his friends talking to him the way that they did, but somehow he managed to. God upheld him. But there are many people who are like this. They don't see the prophet in serving God. They come to church physically, but their heart is not here. You know, I've said it before here that th not everybody who is in the church is in the church. Many who are in this condition are Satan's prime targets for him to tempt and annoy enough to make, try and make them leave the church. And when you're in that condition, you're only going to go one of two ways. You're either going to go serve Satan, or you're going to serve Jesus. You're going to become closer to one or the other. And oftentimes, I believe God allows us to be in these situations so that, that we can become more focused on God. Because I don't know about you, but in my own experience with having trials over the years, they very often, uh, not every time, unfortunately, but they very often uh, force me to focus more on God. And that's what God wants. He doesn't discipline us because it makes him happy. He disciplines us because he wants to save us. He loves us. Jeremiah 12 puts it this way. It says, If you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, how can you contend with the horses? If in the land of peace in which you trusted they wearied you, then how will you do in the floodplain of the Jordan? Back in those days, the Jordan was a huge, massive river. Think of the Mississippi a few years ago, because now even the Mississippi is shrinking. The Jordan River is kind of a, that big compared to what it used to be, but it was, used to be huge. It would flood. I understand a few years ago, the Red River flooded so much that, that you couldn't cross the bridge uh, going into um, Ashdown, Arkansas. Um, and that's kind of what we're talking about here. God is basically telling us here that if you can't handle it now, what makes you think you can handle it later? The Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 12 that there is a time of trouble coming such as never was. Even as bad and crazy as the world is now, it's compared to the time of trouble, everything in the world now is the best day of your life. 
I, honestly, the Bible tells us and the spirit of prophecy tells us that that time of trouble is going to be so bad you can't even picture it. And, and if we cannot handle trials now, we can't handle the time of trouble. Do we see the profit in serving God when things don't go our way? It's easy to serve God when you have everything you want. It's easy to serve God when everything goes your way. When you're sitting fat and comfortable on your couch at home, you could have all the food you ever want. You could have all the money you want. You have everything you want. It's easy to say, praise God. But when we're in a situation like Job, very often we, we tend to make decisions like Esau. And we say, God, where are you? It doesn't seem like you're working. And we end up saying, forget it, I'm out of here. If God's not going to make me happy all the time, I'm out of here. And it's not necessarily God's job to make us happy all the time. It's God's job to make us holy. And that is what Esau did not want. Eventually, it is what Jacob wanted. Uh, but that did take him some time. From manuscript releases, we see all who claim to be Sabbath-keeping Adventists and yet continue in sin are liars in God's sight. Their sinful course is counterworking the work of God. They are leading others into sin. The word comes from God to every member of our churches and makes straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but rather let it be healed. And she continues quoting from Hebrews 12, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God. And she goes on to continue quoting from Hebrews 12. And in this chapter, it says that as Esau, he sold his birthright for what? A, a morsel of meat, it says. And afterward, he realized the mistake that he made, and he was repentant, but not with godly sorrow. It says he sought repentance, but he could not find it, even with tears. He was repentant for the wrong reason, like Pharaoh, like uh, Judas, and like so many other people, like, like um, Ananias and Sapphira, and, and so many people in the Bible that seek the reward of God, but not the requirements of God. Uh, she continues, this is applicable to many who claim to believe the truth. Rather than give up their lustful practices, they venture on in a wrong line of education under Satan's deceiving sophistry. Sin is not discerned as sinful. Their very consciences are defiled. Their hearts are corrupted. Even the thoughts are continually corrupt. Satan uses them as decoys to lure souls to unclean practices which defile the whole being. If we're not 100% for God, then we're 100% for Satan. And as such, if we come to church as as servants of Satan in disguise as Christians or as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, then all we're doing is leading people to Satan. The world is watching us, folks. The world is watching to see what we will do. They're seeing if our actions line up with our profession. Because if you claim to serve God, but you go out to the club on Friday night, people aren't going to want to hear your gospel. If they see you... Uh, professing one thing and, and acting completely opposite to that thing, they don't want anything to do with the message you claim. What is our birthright as Seventh-day Adventists then? We are a church of prophecy. Revelation 10, I believe, foretold that God would raise up the Millerite movement and then the Seventh-day Adventist church. Why? to prophesy again. Revelation 10, remember, it says that John ate that book and it was sweet in his mouth and bitter in his belly. There, there was that great disappointment experience in 1844. And I've, I've been to that spot where they had the great disappointment. And, and um, you know, it was incredible. But the, the, the church that God has called us to be was born out of that experience. We are the remnant who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And let me say that by keeping the commandments of God, we don't do it to earn salvation. We do it because we have it. We do it because we love Jesus. Now, Revelation 19.10 defines the testimony of Jesus as the gift of prophecy, or what we commonly call the spirit of prophecy. Um, 
Now, interestingly enough, Ellen White also defines the spirit of prophecy as applying to all of the prophets, not just her. We teach the truth on prophecy, right? Many, one of the reasons that Christianity is so divided is because everybody has accepted different deceptions coming from the wine of Babylon. And, and, and so as a result, and I can tell you from experience, not very many people are willing to accept the truth on prophecy because they've accepted that Babylonian uh, wine. Uh, the health message. We are a church with a powerful health message. In ancient Israel, uh, as long as Israel was following God in the desert, the Bible says that there was no sick person among them, not even their shoes wore out. And God wants to do that same thing for us today, but he cannot do it for those who don't follow the counsel he has given us. The Sabbath, that's one of the things we are best known for is our view on the Sabbath, right? Um, the sanctuary, perhaps one of the most, I would say, the most important doctrine that we teach because uh, the, san the sanctuary is, is the, I would, I would call it the, the umbrella doctrine, right? What I mean by that is that everything we teach as a Seventh-day Adventist church, every single one of the 28 fundamental beliefs, all of our doctrines can be found inside of the sanctuary message. You see, um, we have all of these different truths and doctrines and, and experiences and everything that God has called us to be as a church, and that, that is our birthright. And do we despise it? Do we despise who God has called us to be? Do we compromise and try and, and try and make ourselves seem not so different from everybody else? One of the questions that I, I think I remember asked being, uh, that was asked during Sabbath school is what was made Israel different? Or maybe it was the lesson that said that. Um, and what was it that made Israel different? It was the fact that they believed in one God. That and the Sabbath. What is it that makes us different? Our belief in who God is, our belief in the Sabbath, the sanctuary, the health message, the the uh, everything. Um, you know, are we like in the case of uh, Luke chapter twelve? Are we the unfaithful servant? It says the my Lord, the unfaithful servant says things like, "My Lord delays his coming." The unfaithful servant uh, uh, beats his men servants and maid servants. Now that's something that we you would go to jail for today if you physically attack somebody in this country. You would go to jail for it if you're caught. Uh, but the in the unfaithful servant will also verbally trash other people. They will trash each other's reputations. Uh, you know. We, we may not like what the preacher says during church and we, we tear him down on the way home or we might be offended at what somebody at church did to us and then we might talk trash about them later with our friends. And that's how we beat our fellow men servants and maid servants. And, and we may be uh, getting drunk on the wine of Babylon and, and consuming the wrong, the wrong uh, kind of books and, and spiritual content from other people who are known false teachers. And God is going to return in a time when that unfaithful servant is not prepared for him to return. Why are they unfaithful to begin with? Because they never were 100%. And they see that Jesus has delayed his return. They say, well, he's not coming back anyway. So let me just live how I want. You know, many of us, we see uh, 1844 as being incredibly significant in our history. And we see 1863 as being incredibly significant. It's because that's the year that we were officially organized as a church. And many people say, well, it's been a hundred and some odd years since uh, that has happened, and Jesus still hasn't returned, and that's, that's the wrong way to focus on this. It's been a hundred and some odd years closer to the return of Christ. We shouldn't look at it as he still hasn't come. We should look at it as he's coming soon. When, when a young couple is about to get married, and, and it's... Uh, Let's say they place their wedding a year in advance. They don't look at it as we still have a year to go. They look at it as I only have a year to go. I only have six months to go. I only have a week to go. It's getting closer and closer and closer, and they're getting more and more excited. And that should be our attitude towards the return of Jesus. It's that much closer than it was before. The faithful servant is the one who did his Lord's will. And... uh continued the message, whereas the unfaithful servant 
is the one who knew his master's will and did it not, and therefore is beaten with many stripes, Jesus says. Those who know better and don't do better or will receive a worse punishment than those who didn't know better. God holds us more accountable if we know more truth than others. And because we are Seventh-day Adventists and we are a church of prophecy and God has called us to share the gospel to the world, if we fail to do that, then we are that unfaithful servant. But, we, but God has given us the opportunity for repentance to be that faithful servant, so that when he comes back and knocks on the door, we can open him, open unto him immediately. The faithful servants are those who are watching. They're those who Jesus will serve when he returns. Can you imagine the God who did not have to do anything for us, still chose to die for us, chose to rise again for us? He still doesn't even have to continue that. He doesn't have to serve us, but when we get to heaven, what does the Bible say in Luke 12? What does the Spirit of Prophecy say? That He will sit us down at a table and He will serve us. The God of the universe who does not owe us a single thing is going to serve us. Why? Because we served Him. Because we love Him. The faithful servants, uh, like eventually like Jacob became, are those who watched those who refuse to allow their hearts to be overcome by the devil. That's what it means here when it says they don't allow their houses to be broken into. That means that's your heart, your mind. Look up that word house in the Greek. Now, uh, that's what Esau failed to focus on. And God tells us that the soul that sins, it shall die. You know, the majority of Christians and even many of us are deceived into believing that God will not punish them for the disobedience to his word. And I don't say this to be doom and gloom or to force people or scare people into obedience or accepting the truth. I, I say these things because the Bible says them. God will punish those who don't repent of their disobedience to his word. But we need to praise the Lord because if you're still breathing, then it means you still have repentance granted to you. Uh, Randy Skeet tells us this. In his uh, sermon entitled, Esau was a Seventh-day Adventist, he says that studies have shown that one of the factors that contributes to spiritual growth among Seventh-day Adventists is reading the writings of Ellen White. Why do I bring that up? Because this is part of our birthright, and many of us despise that part of our birthright. We are told in the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy that the Holy Ghost is the author of both. And yet many of us despise the writings of this servant of God. If we're going to reject her writings for one excuse or another, it's only a matter of time before we reject the Bible. I have seen it happen more than once. When I taught for a couple of years, I remember I did a lesson with the kids from Landmarks of Prophecy, the study on the spirit of prophecy. And there's always that appeal question at the end. If you've ever done an amazing fact study, you, you, you remember they always have that different appeal question at the end of the study. And the appeal question on that one was something like, will you accept the writings of Ellen White? And I had students actually write no. And that's their choice. That's up to them. But then I saw their spirituality nosedive. They started getting in trouble at school. They started uh, having issues with rebellion and, and other issues. And I saw it happen in my family as well, that when we reject the spirit of prophecy, spirituality nosedives. And it's because that collection of writings is as much from God as the Bible is. And I'm not saying elevate her writings above the Bible. I'm saying put them in their proper sphere. I'm saying that you need to study them. And if you're going to be a consistent Adventist, accept them. Many people I've heard make the excuse that because she was a sinner uh, and that she's not God, that they, they use that as the excuse to disregard her writings. But if we're going to make that excuse, we need to do the same thing to the, everything in the Bible outside of the Ten Commandments. Because the Ten Commandments is the only portion of the Bible written directly by God himself. The Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy are both for the purpose of doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, Paul says. Why? That the man of God, or the woman of God, <clears throat> may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. In a 
uh, the testimony, she says men will employ every means to make less prominent the difference between Seventh-day Adventists and observers of the first day of the week. A company was presented before me under the name Seventh-day Adventists who were advising that the banner or sign which makes us a distinct people should not be held out so strikingly. For they claimed that this was not the best policy in order to secure success to our institutions. But this is not a time to haul down our colors or to be ashamed of our faith. This, what she's warning us against here, is the ecumenical movement. Beware of the ecumenical movement. Do not get involved in that satanic nonsense. That's exactly what it is. We are not to be ashamed of who we are, of who God has called us to be. And I've seen so many people try and make us appear like everybody else. That's not what God has called us to do. If we do that, we make the same mistake that Israel did when they asked for a king. We are not to be like the other nations around us or the other churches. And that doesn't make us better than anybody else. Understand, that's not what we're saying. But we need to live according to what God has called us to be. Uh, she goes on to say, This distinctive banner described in the words, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. is to be born through the world to the close of probation. <clears throat> While efforts should be increased to advance in different localities, there must be no cloaking of our faith to secure patronage. Truth must come to souls ready to perish. And if it is in any way hidden, God is dishonored and the blood of souls will be upon our garments. <clears throat> you see, cloaking our faith, sorry, <clears throat> cloaking our faith to secure members is exactly what gave rise to Catholicism. And we know what the Bible says about Catholic doctrine. We cannot be ashamed of what makes us different. We cannot despise the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. And we cannot reject the sources of God's truth in favor of going to other uh, false teachers. Jesus tells us that this, this, it this way. It says, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him, shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Jesus is that water of life. The Holy Spirit, the Father, is that water of life. Revelation 21 tells us this. It says this way, He said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. When we accept Jesus, and, and he gives us that fountain of waters that he will use to, to, to bless other people with. A fountain of, God's fountain of waters is a symbol of salvation in the scriptures. And when we accept him, he, through us, he will make that flow to other people. Too often, we make the mistake that Jeremiah uh, calls us to the carpet in Jeremiah chapter 2. He says, Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this. Be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, saith the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewed them out cisterns uh, or, or wells, broken cisterns, cisterns that can hold no water. Do you understand? Do we understand? The insults that we heap upon God when we go to, to other sources for truth other than that which he has given to us. I'm not saying don't read books outside of the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. I'm saying don't go to those who don't know the truth. Don't go to those who know the truth and still reject the truth. Do we understand the heartbreak that we cause God when we go to these broken wells that do not hold the water of life? The Bible tells us this in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. We believe in God, that's scripture, right? We believe in his prophets, that's the spirit of prophecy. When we are faced with utter annihilation, we need to believe the scriptures. That's what this story is from. Do you remember Second Chronicles chapter twenty twenty? It is one of my favorite stories in all the Bible because it's it's just 
It's God's people who are this little group, this small group, this remnant, if you will, faced with this uh, multinational conglomerate enemy army coming to them. They cannot possibly win this battle. Uh, Je uh, Jehoshaphat had prepared his military, he had prepared his resources, but there was no way that a nation the size of Judah could win against this massive conglomerate army. So they, seek, they sought God, and God said to trust in him. He said to sing, right, form a choir and sing praises to God, and that through their praises, God conquered their enemies. And like these ancient Jews, who trusted God in this situation, you know, we need to do the same thing because we are faced with the same situation. We don't have a massive army waiting to beat down the doors of the church to destroy us all. Not, not, not human, anyway. But we do have that massive enemy army of evil angels who would love nothing more to see you destroyed on the way home. We see this time of trouble coming such as never was, this, this, major crisis, and the only way we're going to survive it is believe God, believe his prophets. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul tells us, that, tells us the same thing this way. He says, quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Paul was preaching to a people in a time when the church was a few decades old, and already there were compromises coming into the church. And Paul's saying, don't despise what makes you God's people. Don't despise the gift of prophecy. There were people who treated Paul's writings back then like many of us treat Ellen White's writings today. And how would the church have survived back then if they would have succeeded in destroying Paul's writings? They wouldn't. How will we survive if we ignore the counsels in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy? How will we despise if we, how will we survive rather if we despise the doctrines that God has given us? Zephaniah chapter 2 verses 1 to 3 tells us this, gather yourselves together. In, the, in view of the times that are coming, gather yourselves together. Gather together. Notice what it says, together. Before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness, for it may be that you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. God is giving us opportunity to seek him more, more than we ever have before. He is giving us opportunity to be like Jacob eventually was and to seek him with all the heart. He's giving us opportunity to stop being like Esau. We need to stop focusing on the temporal. There's, there's nothing wrong with providing for your needs. Right? God gave us work for a blessing. But when we make an idol out of that like Esau did, then we have a problem. We need to be like Jacob and seek God while he may be found. And eventually, Isaiah tells us that we will be saying this. Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. When Jesus comes, there will only be two classes of Christians. You know, there, there, there's coming a time very soon where there's not going to be any such thing as an atheist anymore. There's not going to be any such thing as a Muslim or a Buddhist or any of that anymore. Because Satan's not going to impersonate Buddha. He's not going to impersonate Muhammad or Allah or any of those other false gods. He's going to impersonate Jesus. So everybody will be a Christian of some sort. And when Jesus comes, there will be the Christians like Esau, and there will be the Christians like Jacob, after Jacob's conversion. The Christians like Esau will be those who, are, who will see Jesus and will be terrified, and they will be begging for the mountains and the rocks to fall on them. The Christians who are like Jacob after his conversion are the ones who are going to be saying this verse from Isaiah 25, verse 9, and they're going to have such a joy on their faces that they cannot take their eyes off of Jesus. Now, do we love Jesus that much? 
Think of all the people, let's, let's, let me use this example, think of all the people that, that you've lost to death, that you believe are going to be resurrected in, this, in the first resurrection. Do you love Jesus enough to the point where you're going to say, hey, I'm so excited to see you, but I, I, I just can't take my eyes off of Jesus right now. That needs to be us. And so, uh, for these last days, I, I, I pray that we are focused on Jesus to the level that we need to be focused on him at. Full surrender. Um, and in light of that, our closing hymn is 309, All to Jesus I Surrender.